This is CBC Here and Now. Tonight, three people are dead and four are missing in a plane crash in Labrador. And here's what else is coming up on Here and Now. Well, I was a little bit in shock. I saw this fence over here. I just walked out, check out this chocolate factory and wonder why in the world did they put a fence up there to block a view like that. It's a real impediment to the view. A new addition to the landscape of Signal Hill is attracting a lot of attention. And it has people asking, why in the world did Parks Canada put up this fence? I'm on the unfinished Team Gives You Highway and the government is putting a lot of effort into figuring out how to finish this section of roadway. I'll have details in a bit. We start tonight in Labrador. At least three people are dead and four others are missing after a plane went down yesterday evening. The president of Air Saguenay says one of its planes crashed into a lake in a remote area of Labrador while it was on its way to a fishing lodge. Here now's Jacob Barker is in Labrador and has some more details about what happened. So Jacob, what can you tell us? Well, Carolyn, it's a difficult and tragic day for the com uh, for the fishing community, both here in Labrador and in Quebec, and of course for the families of those who lost their lives and those who are still missing. The plane was on a trip from Crossroads Lake near Shefferville, Quebec, to Mistassin Lake in northern Labrador, about 120 kilometers west of Natwashish. The search was launched after calls made to the plane went unanswered. The Joint Rescue Coordination Center out of Halifax got a call about the overdue plane at about 11.30 last night, and it wasn't until 5 o'clock this morning that the Hercules aircraft conducting the search found the plane about 2 kilometers off the shore of the lake, submerged in the water. Another aircraft has been sent to the area to search for any survivors of the accident. The owner of Air Saguenay spoke to reporters today. He says there were seven people on board, four were guests, two were guides, and the only employee of his airline was the pilot. Everybody is shocked because it's a friend of everybody in the company for, uh, you know, the pilot. So we're hoping that he's still alive. But, you know, it's for now, it, we, we don't know. We're still hoping and uh, we pray and uh, we're praying. So. We were unable to reach anyone at Three River Lodge, the outfitter who was putting on the fishing trip, but Tremblay says the accident likely happened, happened during uh, takeoff or landing. Uh, it was a well-experienced pilot, 61 years old, 20,000 20, hours on his active. So it was a well-experienced pilot. He worked with the outfitters since six years. Now, the next of kin are being informed of the accident and no other details about the people who were involved in the accident have been released. Uh, the cause of the accident hasn't been uh, found yet, but the Transportation Safety Board says it will be traveling to the area to conduct its investigation. Reporting live for Here and Now in Happy Valley Goose Bay, I'm Jacob Barker. <laughs> We're going to bring Ashley in now and Ashley such a disturbing story and so many unanswered questions uh, right now but uh, what can you tell us about what the weather conditions were like yesterday around the time of the crash yeah so the thing with anywhere really in the north is we don't have uh, any radar coverage don't really know what was happening I can look at the models and say you know there's a potential for rain to have moved through we still don't know whether weather even had anything to do with it but we'll take a look at the satellite from around that time and uh, we're losing it there but there you go it does look like there was some cloud cover moving through. The lightning was very east of that area, so uh, potentially just some showers. But again, very hard to uh, determine exactly what kind of weather was happening at the area, but that potential for showers certainly was there. Now, today's weather, much warmer than what we saw yesterday, especially up through Labrador. Uh, 27 degrees in Happy Valley, Goose Bay. A little bit uh, cooler along the coast. Hopedale sitting around 17 is your afternoon high today, and then Lab City was at 24. Otherwise, those temperatures very humid for the island as well, sitting between 18 and 22 degrees. Hotspot was badger there. Uh, otherwise, we're seeing some showers moving through the island right now. We did see some lightning around the Canegra Peninsula.
a little bit earlier. That risk of lightning does exist over the next couple of hours for eastern Newfoundland towards the Avalon, but we'll have all those details coming up. Thanks, Ashley. Well, some new details today about a startling discovery yesterday, just steps from Cape Spear. The RNC pulled a bag of guns from the ocean, real ones, not replicas. Here in Malone Mullen explains. It looks like a daring rescue, a highly trained officer working his way down to the frigid water, 20 meters below. Jagged, slippery rocks and monster waves putting the entire operation at risk. But it's not a tourist gone overboard or a selfie gone wrong. Police here are hauling up one gun, then another, and another. Finally, a black hockey bag, also possibly containing more guns. We counted at least three, plus another suspicious item, a black box bobbing in the water, evading capture. Even this Zodiac raft is having trouble reaching it in the roiling waves. Our marine units are often faced with navigating through fishing grounds, possible set lobster pots, uh, frigid conditions, uh, of course thick fog, and it's uh, communication and training that it allows them to safely navigate. Cape Spear is one of this province's tourist hotspots. Thousands of people descend on the iconic cliffside each year. Sightseers on Monday saw a long line of police cars, bright yellow tape, and this complicated operation to fish the mysterious weapons from the sea. The RCMP aren't involved in the investigation, but they told CBC News that the discovery is not a common one. Police didn't want to say anything about the kinds of guns that they recovered or even how many were in the bag, but they are asking the public to come forward if they know anything. Malone Mullen, CBC News, St. John's. Jeremy Eaton is on the move again tonight. Last night he was at a video game tournament at the Avalon Mall, but uh, he's somewhere different tonight for sure. Jeremy, where are you? Well, Paradise is really living up to its name today. Uh, these brightly dressed crew behind us here, they're the Avalon Dragons. They're getting ready for a practice paddle. I'll tell you why, coming up after the break. Well, warning today at the Muskrat Falls inquiry, the rebates to insulate your house or buy more energy efficient light bulbs may soon be scrapped. For the last decade, Newfoundland Power wanted you to use less power so less oil would burn at Holyrood. But Muskrat Falls will change that, so using less energy will actually drive up power bills. Today, the head of Newfoundland Power said that will mean changes to the take charge energy rebates in the coming six to nine months. I think that the next generation of CDM programs will be more focused on shifting load to off-peak hours and, and making your energy system less peaky to the degree you can. And the province is taking another look at the Team Guzhu Highway and reconsidering where that highway will end. Work started on that project more than 15 years ago, and since then, the metro area has changed a lot, and that's forcing a more thorough review of the highway. Cease Hare has more. Team Guzhu will come to an end on the edge of Mount Pearl at Pitts Memorial Drive and will link with Robert E. Howlett. But so much has changed since the road was first conceived decades ago. First, there were Southlands, but now Galway. Galway, the size of Gander, and the impact of it can't be ignored when considering a new highway that'll soon be linking up with other roads in the area. If you look at some of the impacts that you see now in that end of the city, uh, for example, Galway and other developments over that way. We want to make sure that uh, Team Guzhu is properly aligned to meet the traffic demands that are happening over there. So instead of uh, us rushing a process here, we want to make sure that we take all the last, latest data into consideration. Early designs of Team Guzhu go back to the 1970s. The road as we now know it, linking the outer ring road to pits and beyond, was started around 2004. Since then, there have been multiple completion date predictions and a name change from Bifurcation Road to Team Guzhu after the January 2006 Winter Olympics. While the road officially stops at Topsail Road, the grade work continues 
all the way to Brookfield Road in an area known for a bit of farming. Crocker says engineering options on the final end of the highway are now being considered. We want to interchange with Route 2 as smoothly as possible. That's, that's the thing here. You know, the early drawings on this road actually had at-grade intersections. Crocker adds they are close to settling an issue with the federal government over land at the experimental farm. Now they have to know what they're dealing with. They have to know exactly how many cars and trucks will be using this section of roadway. And the first step in that process, the minister says, is a traffic study. And they'll issue a request for proposals later on this summer. Cease here, CBC News, on the unfinished Team Guju Highway. Well, crews are cleaning up and an oil spill in and around Memorial University St. John's campus. It's not your regular kind of slick. The culprit isn't crude or gas. It's actually cooking oil. Something went wrong with a truck near the Avalon Mall and oil was drained down the parkway and behind the University Center. Cleanup crew members told CBC that the oil was for Burger King. At one point, police had part of Prince Philip Drive blocked off. Some side streets are still closed, but emergency crews have left the scene. Well, a new feature partway up Signal Hill has blindsided visitors who went today to take in the view. Instead of looking out at the beautiful city below, visitors are looking into a brand new fence. Here now's Meg Roberts explains. Arguably one of the most beautiful views in the province, but today it's harder to see. Chris LaDrew is a photographer who loves to take pictures from Signal Hill. He says the fence is an eyesore in a place full of beauty. I guess Parks Canada feels like they can do whatever they want, I suppose, with this land that they, that they control. So it's just that it is part of St. John's and it's, you know, that view is part of who we are and stuff like that. So it's bizarre that it's there and it's a shame. It really is, yep. The fence that you see behind me has been built beside the Signal Hill Visitor Center in front of where the tattoo takes place. The Signal Hill Tattoo is a historical reenactment program with performances throughout the summer. But Parks Canada says lots of drivers slow down in this area to get a look at the show. And the hope is the fence will improve the flow of traffic and actually improve the visitor experience. The tattoo is a paid performance, but Parks Canada insists the fence isn't just to force people to buy tickets. Comedian Rick Mercer couldn't help but poke fun. He tweeted this out earlier today with dozens of angry visitors agreeing. We have... A beautiful city and we like to look at it we're lucky that we have these vantage points and the fact that someone could come and take it away is very frustrating but it's a wooden fence um, so wooden fences go up fast and wooden fences can come down fast fence or no fence parks canada says signal hill still has plenty of stunning views to offer meg roberts cbc news st john's well, Christmas cards and get well cards brought Teresa Power sheer joy until the very end. She died yesterday at the age of 92. We first told you her story in 2014 when the family put out a call for people to send her Christmas cards. Power loved receiving cards and was overwhelmed by the response. And a couple of weeks ago, her family again asked for more cards because she was moved into palliative care. After her death yesterday, the family returned home to open even more cards because they're still arriving. In a Facebook post, Power's son Henry wrote, We as a family feel so blessed to have been the recipient of all your love, prayers and best wishes. Teresa Power will be buried on Friday in her hometown of St. Joseph's. Here's a live shot of the water in Octagon Pond in paradise. A beautiful evening. Things cleared off very nicely during the day. Some dragon boaters are going to be practicing tonight and our Jeremy Eaton is there. We'll check in with him coming up.
Welcome back, everyone. Uh, nice day today. It did yep. clear off it did. in the afternoon. Yeah, But uh, you had a really nice day yesterday. I did. I got to go fishing yesterday mm -hmm. uh, with Nick Montevecchi and Stephen Holden from Saltwater Society in Portugal Cove. Mm -hmm. They invite us out to uh, to fish, and, you know, it's a group that takes tours out and stuff. So uh, I could try my hand at fishing as well and filleting. Take a look. Yeah. The humpbacks were here last weekend. They don't come in and into Conception Bay as much. Though. Right, that makes yeah, sense. <laughs> That's right. And he had some way of no. What is that? Oh, these guys got oh, the on their oh, head. Oh, oh, they're they're ugly. Did you get it? <laughs> <laughs> so weird. These never get eaten either. Last tour, yeah, all the fish were out at 150 feet, and they seem to have moved in closer. Yeah. Oh, what's up there? Something's up there. The eagles perch all along, all along. The perch right on top of the tree. No, he's there. Oh, what is that? Is that a little fish? Oh, 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 fish. Oh, oh my god, that's a spotted one. I think that might be a spotted one. Oh my god. 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 Oh my god, that's amazing. We gotta wait him. Wow. Alright, I'm gonna deal with him. That's scary. That was fighting. That could be a. Beautiful. Woohoo! <laughs> Look at that. Like, you can grab the fur so if it pops off. And you got him good. Oh, he's he got, got him good. He's not going anywhere. <laughs> what a beauty! Yeah. That's a nice fish, yeah. Look at that! Yeah. Heavy, like the size of him. So he's nice. probably. So yeah, he's six. Six pounds almost exactly. Here you go. Beauty! Got these, baby! All right. Start slapping them on the table. Let's get them all up there. We're gonna have a look at our catch. What about the biggest one? Me. It was Ashley. Yeah, it was Ashley. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is that yours? One slot the fish is easy to cut, the other one is hard. It's hard, yeah. Give me your hard slot. Yeah. Oh, you are very good at that. All right, let's see this guy. How's she doing with the fish, right? She's good. Good. She knows what's up. I gotta get better at this. Mm -hmm. Here you go. Nice. Hey, did that? That's pretty good. <laughs> there is a big dog. Maybe it's all hungry. First sheet. Get ready for it. I sure do. <laughs> <laughs> that was so much fun. Thank you so much to uh, Steve and Nick for inviting me out. I had such a great time. And did you get your five fish? Yeah, you sure did. Yeah. They looked really big, too. They were. They were pretty decent. Uh, and then catching that wolf fish, we actually got yeah. two of them, which is very rare for that to happen. But uh, yeah, one of them, we measured it, but six pounds. Crazy. Wow. Yeah. Oh, lots good of fun. Job. Oh, I wish I could be out on the water. It was a beautiful day yesterday. I wish I could be out on the water every single day. I wish we could take the news out under the water. It would be really great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. All right. So it was pretty nice this afternoon. Yeah. Uh, how's it looking tomorrow? Yeah. Temperatures are actually going to climb. So that's certainly okay. good news. But we'll take a look at uh, the afternoon highs that we saw today. 18 degrees in St. John's. Once that those skies uh, cleared out, we even felt a little bit warmer. 22 degrees in Badger. And then you've got those temperatures. 27, the hot spot in Happy Valley Goose Bay. And uh, as far as those temperatures go right now, hasn't really moved much, maybe a degree or two, but it was the humidity that you certainly noticed this afternoon, feeling closer to 21 degrees, or rather feeling more like 21 for uh, St. John's, 29 in Happy Valley Goose Bay. 
and that uh, humidity does look like it's going to stick around for most of us as we head through the next couple of days. So uh, some showers moving through the island today. We saw them develop this afternoon, even some lightning. Uh, that risk is uh, going to continue as we head through the next couple of hours. Once we lose that light, uh, we will uh, see that end, but we are looking at that chance of showers as we head through the overnight tonight. You can see that there. Otherwise, up through Labrador, uh, Lab West as well, looking at that risk of uh, thunderstorms overnight tonight. And we're going to see that shower activity move across uh, the big land as we head towards the morning hours. So here's your temperature somewhere uh, quite nice still. 13 degrees for Cornerbrook, 12 for Port of Basque. Again, light winds tonight, generally clear skies for the most part. That chance of showers still for central towards the Avalon. And then we should see some clearing towards the morning hours. And then uh, St. Anthony sitting at nine degrees. Those winds along the northeast coast, west, northwesterlies, still generally light between 10 to 15 kilometers per hour. And then up through uh, Labrador tonight, uh, 14 degrees for Cartwright, nice tonight. And then 16 for Lab City, again, that risk of thunderstorms over the next few hours. And then showers will continue as we head through the day. So tomorrow, cold front's gonna move through Labrador, which is going to drop the temperatures, especially for Lab West. Once that front moves through, uh, the temperatures will drop into the afternoon. Your highs will be in the morning. And then we've got some shower activity potentially moving through the island as well with some heavier rain towards the early morning hours as the next system rolls in. So here's your temperatures, a little warmer by a couple of degrees. Marystown should reach 26 degrees tomorrow with that chance of showers. Uh, the winds are gonna shift from northwesterlies to easterlies, uh, 10 to 15 kilometers per hour, so still quite light winds. Uh, Clarenville, 23 degrees with plenty of sunshine, it looks like. And then that chance of showers down uh, eventually towards the evening hours. So 28 degrees for Grand Falls, Windsor. Again, going to feel humid closer to the 30 degree mark tomorrow with plenty of sunshine on tap. 20 degrees for Harbor Breton. And then we've got those temperatures a little cooler down through Port of Basque. Again, in the early evening is when we'll likely see that uh, chance of showers move through and then it'll continue to track a little bit further east. 28 in Corner Brook, beautiful afternoon expected with that chance of showers and then Bayver at 22. Up through St. Anthony, still a nice afternoon, 19 degrees it looks like as we head towards Cartwright, sunshine in 21. And then again, those cooler temperatures. So these are going to be your afternoon or your morning highs rather. And then as that cold front moves through, you denoted by the fact that it's the winds are going to switch from a southwesterly to northwesterly, bringing in that cooler air, likely sitting in the low teens by tomorrow afternoon. And then that chance of showers will move right along the big land. So let's look at your forecast. We'll look ahead when I come back. Thanks, Ashley. Well, we saw Ashley earlier out on the ocean doing some cod fishing, and Jeremy is out uh, near the water tonight as well. Octagon Pond in paradise. Uh, Jeremy, how's it looking out there right now? Well, uh, what you're looking at right now is a bunch of the Avalon dragons. Uh, ladies, if you want to give a wave, uh, you're on television right now. Uh, so they're getting ready for a practice paddle. Uh, and then there's a reason they're getting ready for a practice paddle, and that's because they have a big event coming up. And to tell us a little bit more about it is Alice. Alice, thanks for joining us. Oh, so, so glad that you could be here. So on August 17th, we have our festival, and that festival involves community teams. So we're encouraging teams of 20 people to sign up at our website. And it's a fun day and a good time will be had by all. And we only have a few spaces left, so it's important to get that to get in there now. Now, for people who don't know, who are the Avalon Dragons? Who are these very well-dressed and colorful women here sitting in the boat in front of us? We are a group of breast cancer survivors. We are a dragon boat group, and this is a dragon boat that we made that, uh, that we're sitting in. It's a beautiful boat. And uh, we formed about 12 years ago, and we're all breast cancer survivors. And our main focus is basically to show that there's a really good life after having breast cancer. Uh, we come together for friendship, for health, for exercise, and all the good benefits of dragon boating. Dragon boating, some of our viewers may not know it because it's not very popular here. It hasn't been around for a long time. When did uh, people start paddling here on the pond in Paradise? We started about 10, about 11 years ago. We came here uh, on the pond and we are the first dragon boat group in Newfoundland. And our, one of our goals is to spread it across the province and into the community, not just for breast cancer survivors. And that's part of what the festival does. So I'm sitting in a fiberglass boat. You're sitting in a fancy wooden boat. Where did this boat come from, Alice? We made this. All these ladies made it under the uh, under Bruce Whitelaw. He's a naval architect who came to our group and said, 
because we're Newfoundlanders, let's build a boat. And we said, yeah, well, what does it look like? <laughs> and here we are. It took us almost two years, lots of patience, and Bruce has the patience of Job. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> he, and it was all us ladies. It wasn't other people. Well, there was a few other people involved, but it was all the ladies that built this boat. Well, I'm sure everybody watching is waiting for you to paddle, so okay. I'm going I'm to let you... Uh, let you get out of here, so you take it out. Uh, is somebody going to is somebody going to be pounding the drum? Because I think that's my favorite part. Oh, there we go. So here's the drum. So uh, Alice, uh, take it away now. Hips to the gunnels, and back us up, and all together. All right, so they're slowly starting to paddle away. I'm impeding them because I uh, had to sit in this boat next to them. But there go uh, some of the Avalon Dragons getting ready to go out for a paddle. Can we get a few, uh, few more drum beats there? <laughs> well, there you go. I don't know if you want to stick with them for a bit, but... Uh... So we're going to be back. Uh, we got a lot more to come here from Octagon, Octagon Pond. So reporting live from Paradise, I'm Jeremy Eaton for Here and Now. A Harbor Grace man is trying to save the Newfoundland pony one foal at a time. Oh, I'm begging all the people with Newfoundland ponies, please bring them to the Blackbrook Studs Farm and I'll breed them all for nothing. Coming up on Here and Now.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, just months after he died, a 35-year-old Newfoundland man known as a dedicated blood donor is being honoured. Canadian Blood Services hosted several blood donor clinics this afternoon in his memory, including one here in St. John's. Stephen Trickett was originally from Riverhead in the St. Mary's area. He died suddenly of heart failure at the Ottawa Marathon back in May, leaving behind his wife, daughter and soon-to-be-born baby. Known for his humor, donating blood was important to Trickett. Today, blood drives were held in a number of Canadian cities where he lived so his friends and family could honor his memory. Martin Seymour, who knows Trickett's family, donated in St. John's. Today, myself and my daughter were supposed to buddy up to go to Carboneer to give blood. I end up here at the gym with my granddaughter. So rather than make the trip to Carboneer, she suggested I come to Wicklow Street. Here we are. Stephen was a, a strong supporter of Canadian Blood Services, and he donated blood uh, wherever he lived. He lived, uh, you know, in various places across the country. So his family uh, wanted to continue his legacy. Well, a Harbour Grace man with a passion for Newfoundland ponies is working hard to replenish the breed's dwindling population. He has willing studs, but he needs more mares. Here now's Mark Quinn reports. Well, this year we produced uh, four foals in nine days. Harrison Burge has been around Newfoundland ponies like this two-week-old foal for all of his almost eight decades. As long as I can remember that we had a Newfoundland pony, right? And I've been bitten by him and thrown off by him and stomped on and <laughs> you name it like it happened to me. Burge owns and operates the Black Brook Stud Farm here near Harbour Grace because he can't imagine a Newfoundland without Newfoundland ponies. Well, it's a, it's a heritage, right? I mean, the, the Newfoundland would have never survived without a Newfoundland pony. <clears throat> there are now about 150 Newfoundland ponies left. But Burge says, without diversity from different bloodlines, from studs like these, the very future of the breed is threatened. Well, it's like painting yourself in a corner. If you don't, if you don't have the different bloodlines, you can't breed. And if you can't breed anything, it'll become extinct. So that was one of the things that I recognized, that you have to bring back the different bloodlines so you don't create inbreeding. So now, Burge is calling on the owners of Newfoundland pony mares to give him a call. So I'm begging all the people with Newfoundland ponies, Please bring them to the Black Brook Studs Farm and I'll breed them all for nothing. This mare and this stallion behind me may represent the future of the Newfoundland pony breed. And Harrison Verge hopes they'll have many offspring. Mark Quinn, CBC News, Harbour Grace.
Welcome back. Well, we're going to check in with uh, Jeremy now, who's been checking out an Avalon Dragons practice in paradise. So, Jeremy, are you going to pick up a paddle tonight? <laughs> I think that's like the million dollar question uh, every one of these uh, fine women tonight have asked me when I'm going to get out into the boat. For the last time, you may remember, last year at the regatta, I went into the water and I came <laughs> yes, back I without a phone. <laughs> so I'm going to try... <laughs> Probably going to steer clear of that. But now these, uh, the Avalon Dragons and a couple of other teams are practicing their paddling because they have a big event coming up next month. And as we heard from Alice in the, the last half hour that all these women are breast cancer survivors. And I have you know, chat to two of them right now. Uh, Velda, how long have you been uh, paddling with the Avalon Dragons? I've been with the Avalon Dragons now 10 years and uh, thoroughly enjoying it. So when you joined 10 years ago, uh, how did you get involved in this? Well, I almost had to be pulled to the pond because I was 50 pounds every year dragging a leg. So uh, my friends convinced me that it was a good thing. And uh, 10 years later, I'm physically better than I was. And uh, it's been great. How important has this uh, been to your life over the last decade? Oh, it's been very important. All these girls are my sisters. And we share everything. And... Uh, <laughs> And we've had such experiences and such trips, so it's it's been beautiful. No, I appreciate your time. I'm going to run around Gary Locke, the camera guy, so I don't get in the way of the shop. But I wanted to talk to somebody else. Uh, Karen, how are you doing? I'm doing great, thanks. How did you get involved or become part of the Avalon Dragon? Well, a friend of mine suggested uh, that I join. She tried, went to the very first meeting and said, Karen, you have to come. It's so exciting. And so I was at the very second meeting for the group and uh, here I am. And what's life been like for you since you've joined this team? Oh, it's been awesome. Um, the physical uh, aspect on the water, it's nothing better than a really, you know, busy day at work and then to just come out and uh, let her go and enjoy the water. Yeah. And what's it like to spend time doing a physical activity like this with people who have been through a similar thing like you all have been through? Uh, well, the support is awesome as well. I mean, all of a sudden you go from uh, you know, not knowing very many people that are breast cancer survivors to 60 people that, as Velda said, become your sisters and very supportive and lots of fun. Now, if anybody is interested, I know that there's a, Alice said there's a few slots available for the, the paddle races that's going to happen uh, here at Octagon Pond uh, next month. And I know that these women have been very patient with me uh, and I've been holding up their practice. So I'm going to let them get back on the water and get their paddling in. And I'm going to throw it back to, to you guys in the studio. Thanks, Jeremy. Well, youth correctional facilities across Canada are seeing fewer and fewer inmates. During the first week of July, there were just 26 offenders in the region's four long-term youth jails. The secure facilities were built to hold more than 10 times that number. That leaves the provinces with expensive and largely empty spaces. Emma Davey has more in the CBC News investigation. Last week, there was just one inmate at the PEI Youth Center. But earlier this month, the 16-bed facility was completely empty. I think it's fantastic news. Everything we do is designed to keep people in their homes and in their communities and on, you know, on a path that means they're going to be healthy, productive citizens. The shrinking numbers in PEI and elsewhere began in 2003, when new legislation meant putting youth in custody had to be a last resort. The focus turned to restorative justice. We've accepted that youth are different than adults and the framework should be different for youth. We understand that youth are still developing, maturing, they're in a transition phase and the legislation has to reflect that. When we surveyed all four long-term youth jails in Atlantic Canada last week, we found that there were just 26 inmates in secure facilities like this one, built to house more than 10 times that number. In the past five years, the average daily number of inmates has gone down across the region. And everyone agrees that's a good thing. So if you look at the kids who are in Waterville, those are the youth who have committed the most serious offenses. And uh, there's not that many of them, which um, from my position is a good thing. But that still leaves expensive and largely empty buildings. Provinces have cut down on staff and budgets over the years, but now they're looking at better ways to utilize the space. New Brunswick now houses female adult inmates on one side, while the PEI Centre uses some of its space for a program to help young people struggling with substance abuse. Newfoundland and Labrador's Justice Minister says the issue is on his radar, 
but he's been preoccupied with the recent $200 million announcement for a new adult prison. In Nova Scotia, the province moved the IWK Forensic Secure Care Unit into the youth facility in Waterville. The three-bed unit is used for those found not criminally responsible or those sent for a court-ordered assessment. We're required uh, by law to ensure that, that youth and adults are separated. So there's a need for the facility. And those who uh, are present residents, the facility is mostly used now for those most violent uh, crimes. And with the presence of the IWK, they're best able to provide those individuals the supports they need to reintegrate them into the community. New Brunswick's child and youth advocate says he'd like to see what he calls super jails replaced with several smaller facilities in each province. The rehabilitation piece is so important. We don't want them to be adult offenders. Uh, so if we don't work with them and we don't rehabilitate them, then uh, they may become adult offenders. How we do that, my thinking is that it, it's best done in the community if possible. Across the board, officials say they're open to new ways to use the spaces. The provinces are in talks with one another about best approaches, but right now, there's no clear answer for what to do next. Emma Davey, CBC News, Waterville, Nova Scotia. Well, officials say the rabies death of a BC man is an extreme rarity. He came in contact with a bat on Vancouver Island in mid-May. Now BC's Minister of Health is reminding the public to steer well clear of the flying mammals. These are very rare cases, but if people are touched in any way uh, by a bat, which is really the only way to transmit uh, rabies in British Columbia at the moment, that they should go immediately to see a medical professional. From the foundation About 13% of bats tested project. in BC are positive for rabies. Experts say the shy creatures have a bad reputation, but are actually a critical part of the ecosystem. They're important pollinators and consume a huge number of insects, including mosquitoes. It's likely the 21-year-old man who died on Saturday didn't know he had been exposed to rabies. He's the 24th person to die of rabies in Canada since the 1920s. Well, today the Western world salutes a remarkable achievement. 50 years ago, on this day in 1969, NASA launched Apollo 11, sending up the first humans to walk on the moon. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Many Canadians will remember watching that iconic moment, sitting transfixed as astronauts Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins were suited up. Apollo 11's success holds a special significance for those who considered it proof the U.S. had won the space war with the Soviet Union. For others, it was a validation that science could establish life outside the Earth. Celebrations to mark the occasion continue all week.
Welcome back. So it sounds like we probably won't need a jacket if you're in St. John's tomorrow. Looking no, like a nice day. yeah, as far as temperatures go, absolutely. An absolutely beautiful day tomorrow. We'll take a look at that uh, just quick uh, forecast for tomorrow. 20 degrees for St. John's. Again, those winds will shift from northwesterly to easterly through the day, but still stay quite light. Now it's going to be warm for central and the west coast, but uh, the showers will move through and they'll head towards the Avalon as we head through the overnight. And you can see the showers will actually be quite heavy at times towards the early morning hours and then eventually we'll see some clearing through the day. So the second half of the day looks nice once we get those showers through up through Labrador. You're looking at the potential for some showers again for central headed towards the coast into the afternoon. But again, the clearing in behind that. So certainly good news. Those temperatures will stay quite nice as well. Pretty similar to what we're seeing over the next couple of days for the Avalon. Anyway, 19 degrees cooler as we get into that northwesterly flow for central. So back down to 22 degrees, but still quite nice uh, around this time. 18 degrees for Port of Basque with plenty of sunshine and then Happy Valley Goose Bay sitting at 17. So a little bit of a recovery from uh, that drop in temperatures that we'll see tomorrow. Now looking ahead into Friday morning, it does look like we're in for the good first part of the weekend. It uh, looks like sunshine through the day, some cloudy periods potentially moving in into the afternoon. And then our next weather maker moves in Saturday afternoon, especially up through Labrador. And eventually we'll see that potential for showers move towards the west coast and spread across the island into Sunday morning. So the second half of the weekend, not so nice, but uh, some clearing skies into the afternoon and then eventually another round of showers will move through. So here's a look at your temperatures over the next five days, staying pretty similar. So between 19 and 21 degrees, that's about where we should be sitting this time of the year. Still looking like a beautiful weekend with sunshine Friday and Saturday. And then again, overnight Saturday into Sunday is when we'll see that potential for showers and eventually some clearing skies to round out the weekend. Now for central Newfoundland, we're looking at temperatures 28 degrees tomorrow and then cooling off on Thursday, but still quite nice with that chance of showers. Friday looks lovely, 24 degrees and plenty of sunshine. And then again, that chance of showers will move in Saturday evening and clear just in time for Sunday. So 22 degrees should be the afternoon high for you. Again, some humidity sticking around with this as well though. Now for Western Newfoundland, essentially the same forecast, 28 degrees tomorrow, and then a little bit of a dip into the 20 degree range as we head towards Friday and Saturday. Again, with that chance of showers for both days on the weekend, but the sun will peak out as well. So not a total uh, washout there. And then up through L Eastern Labrador, 25 degrees tomorrow, dipping down as that cold front moves through for Thursday and then recovering nicely on Friday with sunshine. Saturday looks a little bit rainy as well with 18 degrees and then Sunday sunshine and 24. And then for Western Labrador, 16 degrees tomorrow, 19 and 21 as we head towards Friday. Saturday, there's that dip in temperatures with those cooler temperatures, only 16 degrees. And then for Sunday, 18 and a little chance of shower. So that's a look at your forecast. I'll have a weather photo. It's a good one when I come back. Thanks, Ashley, and uh, some nice sh sunshine out over Octagon Pond tonight uh, where Jeremy Eaton is. Going to check in with him one more time. Jeremy, how's it going out there? Well, I guess to quote uh, Rod Stewart, some guys have all the luck. <laughs> So here I am, a beautiful sunny day here. <laughs> that was a terrible joke. A uh, beautiful <laughs> sunny day here in Octagon Pond. I, well, well, thank you. You're an easy audience, Carolyn. Uh, so basically, uh, they're out there on the water getting some practice paddling in. I've, I've covered this event uh, as the weekend reporter uh, at least twice before over the last couple of years. And it's a, it's a pretty massive event. They race there on the water behind me, and there's lots of emotional stories. A lot of family members come out. So it really is a great event, and I know that they're trying to get a few more teams to sign up for it to make it even bigger and better because all the money that they raise goes back into buying the boats here, and they have four plus the wooden ones so that they get more breast cancer survivors and anybody else who wants to uh, involved in paddling. So uh, nobody's here to chat to us anymore because they're all out on the water, but that's, <laughs> that's all we can do. So, Jeremy, uh, what are you going to be up to uh, tomorrow night? Will your luck hold in tomorrow's event? <laughs> Well, we'll see. Much like the littlest hobo, I'll be just uh, moving on uh, to the next town. 
from town to town, I guess. Uh, we're heading off uh, to CBS. This is a bit of a weird one. It's uh, So we're going to go from Dragon Boat Racing to some of the Department of National Defense has sent in a team and a couple of ships because they're going to go underwater. They're going to go dive underwater and they're going to go into some shipwrecks off of Bell Island and find some unexploded ordinances. So basically they're going to go looking for bombs that haven't exploded. Uh, we're going to get a view of that. We're probably going to get some underwater footage as well from the divers. I will not be going underwater sadly, but uh, we're going to be checking that in, checking that out in CBS tomorrow. So make sure you tune in to see that because that's going to be a real cool story. Yeah, Back sounds to like you, a Carolyn. really interesting story. Thanks so much, Jeremy. We'll see you tomorrow night. And here's another underwater story. It's uh, one of the biggest threats to marine wildlife in BC, but most of it is hiding beneath the surface of the water. Experts say lost and abandoned fishing gear is taking a huge toll on harvestable fish stocks. The CBC's John Hernandez reports on how so-called ghost nets become an underwater death trap. Burton Scott is on a mission. The commercial diver spends many of his days looking for lost fishing nets along the BC coast, hauling them out of the sea little by little. The nets continually fish by, you know, becoming baited by the animals that are caught and then new animals come in to, to eat those animals and it just becomes a kind of an ongoing sort of death trap. Lost fishing nets like this can sit underwater for decades, maybe even centuries, catching fish and destroying wildlife. It's called ghost fishing. They can cover the seabed and just completely choke out a reef or cover an area so that nothing can live there. An estimated 800,000 tons of fishing gear worldwide gets lost to the ocean through incidents like storms and snags each year. The issue has caught the attention of Scott and his close friend Gideon Jones. The pair have launched a nonprofit to clean up old fishing nets in BC, some the size of football fields. And if you just think of a net like about 5,000 of those like six pack rings that choke out marine wildlife, you get a sense of the impact one net can have. It's unclear just how much old fishing gear is floating in BC's coastal waters. Earlier this year, DFO crews recovered hundreds of abandoned and unmarked crab traps. Last fall, this old net swept through the Fraser River, killing several seals. Thousands of nets have also been removed off the coast of Washington state. Gear that gets lost tends to sna or snag or get tangled with deployed gear, which causes more gear loss. Experts like Joel Baziuk say ghost gear could be destroying up to 30% of harvestable fish stocks. It's a loss to, like I said, fishers themselves, but also coastal communities who depend on fishing, uh, the fishing industry. Right now, much of the recovery work is being done by volunteers and nonprofits on tight budgets. But some are hopeful the tide is turning. The DFO is partnering with the Global Ghost Gear Initiative to promote clean waterways. That could mean more funding for people on the front lines. John Hernandez, CBC News, Vancouver. We want to know where you're to. This photo is taken on the west coast. What a great shot. Uh, Clyde Thornhill sent us this photo. And I'll let you know where it was taken when we come back.
Welcome back. Great picture of the day today. Yes, a lovely shot there. Even some lenticular clouds in the background with a lenticular. rainbow. Lenticular. Yes, so that should, well, maybe it doesn't give you a clue of where it was, but it was taken in gross morn at uh, Greenpoint Campground. And you see those lenticular clouds in mountainous areas. Can you please qu quickly tell me what lenticular is? It's like, it looks like a lens. Oh, okay. Yes. So Clyde uh, Thornhill sent us that photo. Thank you so much for sending that in. Oh, Great shot nice. there. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. And that's it for us for this Tuesday evening. Hope to see you tomorrow night. <laughs> Good night. Good night.